hi hitesh good evening hi hello sunil ji <laughs> namaskar so friends let me just give you a brief overview of uh, infinity so infinity is a 52 week meditation program a space where we can shed away all our labels and embrace pure self discovery so this session infinity is an effort to create pure space where all of us can just forget everything forget everything about ourselves in meditation and then experience the unlimited self in ours so if you notice the infinity the word infinity we there a lot of i in it so the we are coined it such a way that we are dropping all the i's i is again which is identifying with self the ego the belongingness to a particular religion or a country or a spiritual organization guru or you know spiritual practices belief systems so on and so forth so we are dropping all those i and replacing i with one one is nothing but oneness so that is the core essence of infinity and that's the reason every infinity is one of the most sought after and um, we have various spiritual masters you know interacting with the masters to understand learn from everyone and this is a pure space so ultimately we all are seekers of truth and truth is always one so that's the reason that's the that's the core concept that's the that's the essence of this whole infinity so once again warm welcome good morning good evening everyone who has joined from different corners of the globe today we have a very very wonderful learned speaker i mean uh, he is uh, i was going through his bio and i felt i need a session by itself to introduce him but i'll try to do justice so hitesh is a seasoned and one of the most sought after person in the field of mind body energy connection work he has been teaching meditation to different people across different geographies for more than decade and a half he has conducted a lot of workshops almost 500 plus workshops he has conducted past life regression inner child work life between lives regression family constellations ancestral healing rebirthing breath work these are just some of those names across among many he has conducted he is also an author of the best seller book called sundaram speaks <clears throat> excuse me conversations to awaken your soul's wisdom he is also an award winning coach par excellence a workshop leader and a healer with more than a decade and a half experience in the field of human behavior now this is one piece i would also like to pick because i am also a big fan a curious learner on this subject called human behavior he is also an internationally registered consciousness coach with certified coaches alliances called cca in canada and international coach federation icf with more than i think 6000 plus one on one healing and coaching sessions he has transformed people in healing childhood and past life traumas ancestral pattern deep subconscious beliefs and he has led a life with a meaning and purpose well after going through this bio i was awestruck and i was like amazed and i am so honored and humbled to host you hitesh ji without much over thank you again everyone so much for joining for the program and uh, going through a wonderful meditation hitesh ji once again welcome and uh, yes so this platform this today's program is all about hitesh so we would like to know more about who hitesh is and uh, we will delve you know deep dive into more about your Uh, experiences your journey your practices and uh, your bio is <laughs> really great to see you you know um, see you doing many things and uh, really wonderfully that too so hitesh one basic question is what drew you into this world of meditation and into this daughter field of that you have mentioned mind body energy connection was there any particular moment or any kind of experience that sparked your interest in this area right so i think uh, from the times when you know everybody 
looks for a career, uh, maybe after like tenth, eleventh, and twelfth, we you know everybody has this burning question: What is it that we are going to do? So you know there was a time when I was also searching that what is it that I am going to do going ahead. And I would see my friend circle speaking about different, different things. So I'm going to pursue UPSC. I'm going to pursue law and, you know, all that. And this question was with me. And of course, once upon a time, I thought, okay, I'm going to be uh, pursuing, you know, master's degree in business administration. But then there were many fields like marketing, finance, and human resources and operations. During my times, these were the four fields which were available. Right now, it has grown a lot. So, but one thing which got stuck with me was human resources. In parts of my heart, I always wanted to pursue something regarding, you know, the human behavior and how the psychology works then. You know, and I think that became a driving force for me to be pursuing the career in human resource management. And, uh, you know, but there was a great notion, great belief system, which was around in the society that, you know, human resources would not pay you much. And it is for girls, you know, it is not meant for boys, because I saw that in my batch also, if we were 19 students, 17 of them were females, only two were males. So that started from there, but since I had chosen it very consciously and I thought, okay, let me go ahead with it. And I found out that it really worked for me. And I got the job of my choice. I got the job in human resources and I started to work in Asia as one of the largest fashion houses I began to work. And it, it started well. And I grew up the hierarchy really well. Like in five, seven years, I grew up quickly, the organization led up. But while growing, I also realized that whatever I thought of this field, it is not exactly that. Uh, maybe uh, it is about transformation, but the transformation is not coming from an internal space. It is very much based on SOPs. It is very much based on, you know, what management wants and finding an easy way. That is what I found out with the field. And that became a cause of my stress. I, because I had chosen this field consciously. And I realized that it is empty from within. It is not what I really, uh, you know, looked at. It is not the same way. And that started to give me a lot of stress because, you know, during that time, it was, it was in 2006 and seven started to realize that, uh, you know, what is life going to be? You go from like eight to eight. This is what is life. Because there is no other room for creativity. There is no, no, no room for exploring your own self because human field is the most creative space. You know, it is the most creative resource which is available apart from the other, you know, be it marketing and finance. That also needs people. You know, those fields are also on the basis of humans. But then it was not letting me to explore my own creative uh, you know, space and to churn my own creative juices. And I think that led me to a lot of stress to an extent that uh, you know, all my childhood physical ailments began to come down. Like I was, as a child, I was suffering from chronic asthma and that began to surface very quite often you know, and uh, that uh, led me to feel that you know it is not good being me and once upon a time I was just speaking to my sister over a phone call and and that's how I got to know she said oh I'm meditating every day I've recently started why don't you also meditate so I started to meditate and uh, you know I started to take a lot of interest in this to an extent that I also organized an engagement program at my organization, you know, wherein people can come and meditate. For three months, we created a kind of a program wherein every Saturday, every Friday morning, we will come together and we will meditate. You know, the group started with 100 people and then it came down to 90, 80, 70. To an extent that when it was the end of those three months, 
those were only countable people, like two or three. One was me and there were two other people who were continuously medicated. And when I look back, I see that that happened only for me, you know, because the rest everybody had, uh, you know, parted ways and they moved somewhere else. But I think it really grew my confidence in meditation. It really grew confidence in me in listening to my heart and following the path that I wanted to. And I think that was my breakthrough moment because that led me to explore the world the way I wanted to. Uh, more than externally, I started to, you know, explore the internal world. And from there on, I think the rest of the moments, rest of the shifts began to happen because that was the very first crack that happened. From that crack, the light began to enter. Wow. That's so beautiful. I mean, you found your journey right through the meditation itself. Wonderful. Um, you mentioned about transformation. So I would like to pick something from there. Like if you can share any transformative experience that you have had through this meditation or any other spiritual practice, either through personally and since you're guiding many others and you have dealt with so many people by now. So I want to pick maybe an, a, a one or two transformational experiences if you had. So the very first transformation definitely was with my, uh, my physical state. As I mentioned that when I was 12, I was diagnosed with chronic asthma. Like on the very first day when I went to visit the doctor and doctor just gave me the inhaler and the steroids in my hand. He told my parents that it is going to be lifetime for him because uh, you know these conditions do not reverse. And he has crossed the state which is like bronchial. It is not bronchial anymore. It is severe in nature. And from there, I think till the time I became 19, I was constantly consuming those steroids. And because of that, my body became really fragile. I was, my immunity was low. I was not as, you know, as fast like the, you know, the, the boys or the girls of my age group, you know, because I was very fragile in nature. And when I entered the world of meditation, I think the very first thing that happened to me was the reversal of this because I could reverse you know this chronic asthma that started at the age of 12 and when I reached in the zone of meditation I think I was 24 when I started to meditate the very first thing that happened to me was the reversal of this and uh, it has become close to 15 years 15 16 years the asthma has never come back I don't even know what inhaler I was taking and uh, the extension of that uh, asthma was also migraine. So that also dissolved completely. You know, I, right now, I hardly get any cough, cold, any headache, hardly. So I think that was the very first change that happened in me at a physical level. Of course, at an emotional level, I could deal with a lot of limiting beliefs that I carried about myself. Because uh, as a child, I was, you know, I'm born into a Punjabi family. So Punjabi kids are fairer, you know, they are like very good skin. And uh, I was the only one carrying dark skin. And so whosoever would come at home and they'll point at me and they'll say, he does not, you know, belong to your family. And you know, <laughs> a lot of stories would come up from my cousin and they'll say, oh, we bought you, got you from uh, Market you know, or... <laughs> some other locality, some other place. Yeah. Although they'll say it in a very light mood, but the child inside me will take it really hard. And Correct. so much so, I will feel that something is wrong with me. It is not good being me. And, uh, you know, and I think that's where I started to not like myself. I moved away from myself. When I tried being somebody else, you know, I would copy someone. I would try to you know, compare myself with others and try to do what they are doing because I was looking for a lot of love in the form of appreciation and you know that was my craving although I got it from my parents but uh, when you go outside from the zone of your parents the world is not the same way so that's where I think I I started uh, you know I dealt in a long way in a, in a different way as far as the you know that I'm not loved I realized that it is okay being me. It is okay 
being who I am, and I matter. I matter to myself. And that is another, uh, you know, transformation as far as working on my own emotions and on my own belief system. And as far as my working with people is concerned, I think uh, it's been close to fifteen years that I've been working with people one to one and in group spaces as well. I see people. Uh, going through similar sort of experiences that I have been through, like physical transformation, be it chronic, very chronic in nature. I've seen somebody who's been struggling with migraine for good 25, 30 years, and they're dropping it just in a blink of eye. I have seen them. I have also seen people, uh, you know, those who were at the cusp of dropping the body, uh, and they could live for more than two decades and they lived so beautifully. It's just that they could grab their life urge and they wanted to live. I think, I think uh, every transformation that I, all the experiences that I experienced being with people, I think everything has so much to teach and for me, everything in that space is a transformation. Wow. So as Steve Jobs says, connecting the dots. So now I can see it started off with you healing your own inner child because of the baggage that you carried. And then you went on to uh, help others. And little by little, I think the organization called Life Here and Now also bloomed up. Great, great, wonderful. So yeah, now that Life Here and Now is a big organization, uh, your wife is also along with you to, you know, take up this. Uh, I'm sure taking up, growing an organization to such an to such a level, you know, every journey has and poses some kind of challenges. So throughout your journey, what have been some of the biggest challenges that you have faced, either personally or helping others, and uh, how did you overcome? I'm just trying to pick those inspirational yeah, yeah. things. <laughs> So uh, in 2011, when I was into intense meditation, I, uh, you know, that one fine day, the meditation, you know, I explored, it came to me that I should explore it more. And that's how, uh, you know, I met Patriji in 2010. I was meditating from 2008, but after two years, I met him because he had come once to Delhi. And that's how, you know, I met him at Shastriji's place, DLN Shastriji's place. And uh, and then in 2011, I met Dr. Newton and Dr. Lakshmi. So uh, from there, you know, under their guidance, I learned past life regression and all other modalities. And it came to me that this is what I wanted to do. This is what the human resources for me is. You know, that's what I'm searching. You know, that transformation can be experienced from within, not just momentary in nature, it has to come from the space of permanence because we are made from that permanence element within. So, of course, when it came, I was growing very well in my job. I was doing so well. And, uh, you know, so that giving it up, giving it up and following something which is very unconventional in nature, that itself brought a lot of insecurity. Like, how will I you know, manage my things and run my errands and how would I take care of my family because by that time my father had also retired and I was the only breadwinner for the family. And so not many insecurities showed up. Like, how can I do it? It's not possible. So a lot of struggle that I went through because a lot of fear had surfaced and I took full one year, you know, to process that fear from 2011 to 2000. 12 October, uh, I processed it uh, fully. Like I would sit for three hours of meditation. One fine day, I took a sankalpa. That 40 days, I'll meditate for three hours to, you know, to transform this fear completely. So I would meditate three hours. And on the 40th day, it uh, happened to me that I could, you know, write my own resignation and I can put that up. So in 2000. 12, I gave up, you know, the, the very conventional system of working. And I realized that the, the responsibility of, you know, coming from that creative space is very, very important 
because even right now when you talk about life here and now i see that the very only objective that me and my wife carry that we want to explore ourselves creatively fully like there should be no barrier here that i cannot do this or i cannot do that and i think uh, we're just following our hearts that's the only uh, only force of course we definitely you know incorporate the mind because uh, does not mean that you have to reject the mind it simply means that the heart can have its own mind to think and that's where you know we in- integrated because if the heart is if the heart is the shakti the mind is the shiva so the the amalgamation of both the union of both we try to operate from there and i think that's what is happening and uh, just by doing that this is the only intent that we carry when it comes to you know working with the organization and we really don't feel that it is a work for us we don't feel that it is an organization we feel that it is just a fortunate opportunity that god has the divine has offered to us to explore ourselves explore our inner realms and whatever we explore with that if we can touch anyone whoever is ready i think that's good that much great well if i can define that you guys are beautiful karma yogis because work is driving you you're not attached to the organization and you're driving it from heart and that shows wow um so hitesh i'm i'm curious to know about this um you mentioned about human behavior and you did mention that you were interested in human be- uh, uh, human re- that's the reason you took took up uh, mba in hr but i mean now when i connect the dots yes human behavior and your own experiences and then you are connecting with people now you are in a, your your entire i wouldn't call a job or profession but whatever you do is all connecting with people people's mind and it's all again connected to behavior but back then what led you to choose human behavior as a subject which is you know close to your heart is it something intuitional or uh, uh, i'm just trying to see how as i said initially now you, you can sit and cross the you know you can connect the dots but back then you don't know where you are life is heading you just picked up and things just moved on but i'm trying to pick up what exactly nudged you in the mind to take those decisions or take that particular path typically i think that happened to me intuitively definitely the major portion came to me in a very intuitive manner but at the same time when i look back to my own childhood also i could uh, you know i i noticed that a lot of my friends would come to me just for you know sharing their heart out because i could listen to them in a very non judgmental and a non critical way and uh, and you know we all will do group study so they'll you know the, the major portion will come to me to study and you know to share it with them i think being that confident being that uh, somebody who can listen to somebody somebody who can counsel i think that was very natural with me uh, i think that had uh, grew it you know it grew further into the space that i picked up okay 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 so it's so important for us to trust those intuitive messages that comes from within very much uh, many have advised the same like you can trust your intuition than your brain than the mind wow so how do you define awakening in the context of your work and uh, if you can enumerate when did you first experience this because awakening is such a broad word and you have come through those you know stages so how do you define this so for me definitely you know it was not one such experience that led me to you know opening the gates there were many satori experiences like small small experiences coming in bits and pieces i just share one of the early experiences so as a child i was very ardent follower of lord shiva you know my mother instilled you know that we should meditate on lord shiva we should go to temple and offer you know our prayers and i've been doing that and i realized that 
you know, when uh, I was a child and I would offer, you know, that offering that like gel to the sacred water to Lord Shiva and I would feel that sense of awareness, which I right now feel, you know, when I meditate, it is similar, but the way was different there. And, uh, you know, I remember one fine day, me and my brother fought and uh, my bua said that whosoever is lying, you both would be now, you know, locked in a room and whosoever is lying, the goddess Kali will come and she is going to punish that whosoever is lying. And I felt, why would she punish? You know? And I never felt that she is a very, uh, you know, a goddess from whom we should be fearful of. So these things were there. And of course, you know, I think uh, maybe from my past lives also. But those, those things were very clear inside of me. And, uh, you know, as I started to grow further. So these are small, small awakening moments which I feel. Because I would question the, the conventional ways which were set up, you know, because I would question my parents, I would question my bua, I would question others that if you are doing this, why do you are doing this? What will happen if you won't eat rice on a kadashi? What will happen? You know, so I will, I, I will ask these questions. That is a separate story, like they will shut me up and they'll say, don't ask, don't question, just follow. But eventually it brought a lot of uh, spiritual scientific temperament inside me, like now I can see that why we do what we do. There's a reason behind it. And why do we fast? There's a reason behind that. And, uh, uh, you know, in uh, the times when I was preparing for the competitive exam of MBA, uh, so my teacher told me, that there's one section that comes to you in the, in the competitive exam that is English usage. So, there will be a lot of lengthy paragraphs that you have to read and a lot of high vocabulary that comes during that. So uh, our teacher told us that five, six books, he shared that you are going to be reading these five, six books. And one book that came in my hand, you know, that there was this person who's, who was looking straight into the eyes that was the, on the book cover. That person is looking on straight into your eyes and he was wearing orange. And very weird title. I felt, oh, I'm into academics. Why is he giving me this sort of a book? But then I started to read. I will reveal the title of the book later. But I started to re read that book. And I really found that that book had some really powerful vocabulary being used. Such, such a superlative way of explaining yourself, you know, in the language of English. It is so floral in nature, so beautifully written. And later on, at the end of the book, there was this, you know, that picture of a yogi, which was put, and whose eyes are up, is looking upward. And I felt so drawn to this, like, oh, wow, who is this man? And uh, I think that was the very first seed that sprouted inside me, as far as moving from that ritual to the spirituality. You know, that book led me and that book was no, nothing but uh, none other than you know autobiography of a yogi. That was the very first book because Yogananda's picture was there on the, on the book cover and behind there was Mahatar Babaji. You know, so I think that book came to me. I was not searching for something into that and that drew me into you know, the zone of meditation. I would talk a lot about meditation but I did not know that what was the technique, although I was doing it as a child, but since nobody taught me, I was not into that formal structure of it. But yes, that was another Satori experience that happened. And the real awakening, if I were to say, working on my own issues, as I mentioned before, uh, like coming out of my own cage of thinking and my physical state, that was the awakening. And that led me to believe if I can do it, Anyone can do it. And, and I think I can just take that up and can spread it further. Wow. Beautiful. Uh, so, Hitesh, I noticed you mentioned about past lives, right? And uh, you are also a past life regressor and you, have, you are a healer, you know, ancestral healing and so on. So, I'm curious to know what role do you believe this past life and... Uh, 
you know, past lives, many lifetimes and these ancestral patterns, do they play in shaping our current, this moment, I mean, experiences or behavior patterns and so on? What is the correlation? How, how do they? Yeah, influence? definitely. They, you know, because uh, there's the game of knowing and forgetting, which is happening. When you are outside the body, you will know, oh, this was what I was supposed to do. But the moment you come back again in the body, you forget, you know, what was I supposed to do? What, why am I here? You know, I will never ask these questions. Rather, the life will set up situations in such a way so that you can ask, ask these questions to yourself. For, for example, for me, the very stressful moment at my office and the way I was feeling, that led me to ask this question. Why am I here? Why am I doing this eight to eight? Why not something else? You know, for others, there could be an illness that can hit this question to them. So there's a constant game of knowing and forgetting, which, which is what is we are playing. What we don't know, we have to know. Whatever is unconscious, we have to make it conscious. And I think these patterns, like from the patterns of the past lives or patterns from the ancestors, they come to us in a very unconscious way. Like they are in the deep down unconscious of ours. Till the time you bring them under the light, they keep playing, playing in the deep. Uh, you know, your your hidden layers, the hidden layers of your psyche, they'll keep playing, keep operating. You know, I might ask, oh, why I'm born in this family or why I'm born like this? I will not ask, you know, I will not get the answer to this till the time I delve into that unconscious, till, till the time... I deep dive in my own, you know, dive deep in my own self and find out what led me to, you know, this. Because there is a cause and effect. They go hand in hand. So what spirituality does, what meditation does, it helps us to explore that realm of unconscious. It helps us to tune into that space and bring that under the light. Because once it, it is brought under the light, then it is no more unconscious. You are able to overcome that. You are able to, you know, break your own pattern. And of course, these modalities like path flight progression, they help you to set that inquiry for, you know, set that inquiry of being conscious. They hit you in that inquiry because otherwise the inquiry does not come. We are not very open to taking inquiries because like a life moment will click an inquiry in your life. For example, I'm ill. The doctor now has put me on medicines because let's say I'm diabetic. Now I'm constantly taking insulin. But I, if I don't ask this question, what in me attracted this? Why at this point in time in life? Why this now? What have I done you know, because of which I have manifested it? If I will not ask these questions till the time I hit that. So there could be a two-way process. Some people, they look for answers externally. You know, they'll go out to a doctor and doctor will give them a medicine and will say, oh, it is over. For some of them, they'll try to find out cause insight. You know, and that's a very conscious way of doing because more than external changes, you first have to change internally because your external world is a reflection of your inner world. So if you change internally, if you find out answers internally, and that's where I think the unconscious begins to turn into conscious. And all these modalities like help you to bring that inquiry of you know that that very conscious being that's all. okay so that's why understanding that is important great so how do you help individuals tap into the so is that how you i mean is it because with this um past like liberation therapies that you get into the individuals and um, you try to awaken the inner wisdom and uh, let them discover their own life purposes? Is that how? Yeah. So uh, usually when we speak to people, when we connect with them, we take their life history. We ask them, like, you go to a homeopath and the homeopath takes down the life history. We just exactly the same way we take down the life history. And we'll ask you weird of weird of, weirdest of questions. Sometimes they'll feel, oh, why you are you asking me this? But we'll ask you because... The job here, the work here is not to look at your actions or what is happening in your external plane. 
but usually to look in the subtle plane. What led you to that action? What is the energy behind taking that action? So that's where, because your energy, we are energy beings and you know this energy leads you to the outer reality. So you have to tune in because this work is a root cause work. You, know? you cannot cut the branches of the tree and you say, oh, we have weeded it out. But you have to go to the very root to understand. And that's where, you know, when we take down the history, we make down notes and we understand. And then we try to see person from several layers. Like, for example, who we are today, like you and I and everybody, majorly there are four milestones that we have covered in our journey. We try to look you on those milestones. What are those milestones? The very first milestone is your childhood. The first seven to ten years of your life, they lay the foundation of who you are. You know, for example, there are these brain waves that we talk about, alpha, beta, alpha, theta, delta. You know, we talk about these. As humans, we majorly live in beta and, you know, alpha. Like, beta is very highly erratic in nature. Like, the frequency of the thoughts is really high. Alpha is a little lower than that. Theta is further lower than that. Like meditative state can be theta state because we are highly absorbing in nature. And delta is a sleep-like state wherein, you know, the frequency of the thoughts is really, really slow. It's almost like zero to four thoughts, not more than that. Uh, as kids, we are majorly, the first seven years of our life, we live in theta. So theta state is the highest absorbing state. Like whatever is being put inside of you, what is whatever is being fed inside of you when you are in theta, it is going to directly hit your subconscious. It's going to, like a sponge. We also say like children are sponge. They absorb everything like a sponge. So that is a very first element that we explore. For example, if as a child you have gone through uh, you know, a tough time with your parents, let's say you did not get enough love, care, attention from your parents, your parents separated or did not live together due to any reason, it has an impact on the child. You have seen your parents fighting or you've been mocked. You've been mocked for your appearance, the way you are. You've been mocked by the teacher for scoring less. You know, all this has an impact on how we grow into it. So for example, if as a child you've been told you are good for nothing, you know, you're not going to do anything. It is, you are an idiot if you've been told that. It is quite likely when I grow as an adult, that that word is still inside of me. That statement is now being replaced. I don't need anybody to tell me that now because now I have internalized it and I operate from that state. So that energy creates that word for me. You know, I keep doing the work, but I see that work does not give me, you know, the fruits the way I want. Why? Because this belief, this this is a hindrance to you. And the way you look at yourself, like, you know, how much you are in love with yourself, how much you care for yourself, that also being taught to us as a child. So that all has an impact on, you know, what as an adult we grow into. That's the very first dimension of our, you know, our foundation. The second foundation, second milestone is our mother's womb when we are inside the mother's womb. Because during that time, the child and the mother are one. So whatever happens to mother, the child naturally absorbs it. So for example, from what space the baby was created? Was it created out of love? Or was it created out of force? Was it a marital rape? Whatever, what condition was it? That has an impact on the child. We create that garbha sanskar inside. And... For example, the pregnancy happened in a very accidental manner. The mother wanted to take pills and she took the pills, but the, you know, the baby could not be aborted. And the baby came and now the mother is constantly repenting. Why this? Why it's happening? So this child is now going to carry the belief of constant rejection. You know, that Because the very source has now rejected you. The source that was supposed to give you the birth you're coming to her because she does not have any other option. So this rejection will now further be shown in the other events of your life. For example, you are rejected at school, you are rejected by your friends, you are rejected by 
your girlfriend, you're rejected by your boss, and you constantly experience that rejection. So much so that one fine day, you ask yourself, why me? Why it is happening to me? And from there, rather than looking for answers outside, because right now when people say, why me? They will come from an angry space. Of course, we come from an angry space, but we look out for answers outside. I say, I will not let others to now reject me. I will reject them before they reject me. I say this, but this is not going to be the healing. This is not going to get you the answers till the time you look within. So that's where we look into. We look into your mother's womb region, like where, what was happening with her when you were inside that. The third space, the third milestone is what kind of life your ancestors lived. Because, uh, you know, for example, what kind of life your mother had? How was her childhood? What kind of childhood your father had? It had impact on what adult they have grown into. Like, for example, let's say a mother who as a child did not get enough nourishment from her own mother. Let's say her mother was struggling with a death of a child. She lost a child and during that time, child, during that death, this new girl was just infant and she was on the breastfeed. Because of her own depression and everything, she could not breastfeed the girl. And this child will feel unloved because the mother's breast is nothing. It's not just milk. It is receiving the warmth. It is receiving the love. The love goes directly into your mouth. It nourishes you in a very different way. So this child who does not feel nourished by the mother will grow into a, an adult maybe who is now seeking that nourishment from the kids. Why? Because the child inside never felt nourished. And now she wants her kid to, you know, her kids to nourish her. She is still a child in the grown-up body. You know, so that is another one example. In the same way, what happened in the history of your ancestors, you know, because by way of DNA, we pick up the impressions of our ancestors. We might not have met our great-grandparents, but the impression is there in the end. Like, you know, we see the diabetes move from one generation to another. We see hypertension moving from one generation to another. These are just physical symptoms, you know, and in the medical field today, they ask you these questions. Is it hereditary? Did you notice this kind of symptom showed up by any of your family members or any of your ancestors? Because they see it with impression of DNA. Like, my family history had asthma. My great-grandmother had and her father had and it traveled to me. It came to me. But I could break the pattern. And how could I break? When I move from the unconscious to conscious. In the same way, like, you know, there are patterns that are unconsciously moving with us. When we try to deal with them in a very conscious manner, we can, you know, rise above those patterns then that's where the ancestral work comes into the picture. It does not mean that you will get what your, your, your family history has gone through. It will definitely come to you. No, you have your power, power of free will. But to reach to that, you have to heal your wounds. And that's how you can create your reality. So that's the third dimension. The fourth dimension is our past lives. There are certain unfinished businesses that we carry from different lifetimes. Not in the form of receiving a punishment here. No, karma is not a punishment. Karma is a feedback. It's a feedback system. It wants to tell you, like, you know, there's a room for improvement. And we say karma is a teacher. It wants to teach you. You might find it hard, but the more graceful and respectful you are to this energy, it can teach you in the most humble ways. It can make you more, most beautiful being on the earth if you're humble to that. And... You know, like we carry themes, like there are movies, every movie run on a theme, every, every life run on a theme. Like in this lifetime, I have a theme. In this lifetime, you have a theme. Everybody has a theme. And we are here to move around that theme and work on our lessons and, you know, and, and try working on that. So that's where, you know, the, the past life comes into it. So there are other dimensions also, but these are four major dimensions that we you know, we work around. Of course, there are soul scripts, the soul contracts that you make, your future possibility. 
we try to look into these dimensions when we work with yeah, I, I was sort of connect, trying to connect that also. So there's also an answer saying uh, there's a soul plan. Now, for example, uh, you were teased when you were, you know, a kid that uh, you're dark skinned and uh, probably that led you to what you are now because that has triggered. So uh, at that point of time, that is something which has deeply hurt and we shouldn't have happened. We're trying to clear all that. But probably that's also a soul plan. Now, how do we, like you enumerated a lot of examples, like um, based on relationship uh, and, you know, mother, womb, you know, what kind of thought process they carry. So how do we, like, I'm just trying to understand, um, on one side, we're saying soul plan, other side, we're also trying to heal this. So how do you see this? Because in one point of time, we try to accept the situation because it's a soul plan. On the other side, we are also trying to heal. Yes, that's also important. How do you take this forward? I mean, sometimes I myself have got you know stuck on both these sides. So like how how do you how do you you know explain this? So everybody has a soul script. Like what do you call a soul plan? Everybody has a plan. You know, before we make a movie. The director will write them. The writer is going to write them. In the same way, before we take up a lifetime, we take up a body, we write the story, the storyline for it. We add the characters and we move it around the theme that I want to learn. We do it around that. For example, let's say in a lifetime, I did a lot of things which were out of impatience. I, I hurt a lot of people through impatience. In this lifetime, in the soul states, I realize that this is the lesson I have to learn. And for this lifetime, I will learn patience. Now, when I write the script, I'm going to write the events in such a way, first, that I'll be taken away from impact, taken away from patience. Why? Because only when I move away from something, I will try to come closer to it. Like, for example, I will not pick up a glass of water Till the time I feel thirsty. In the same way, this impatience creates that thirst. This will arise a question inside me. Why it is happening to me? Why not somebody else? Everybody is doing this. Why good things happen to bad people? Why bad things happen to good people? You know, we'll ask these questions. And this triggers, this triggers a lot of inquiry, the self-inquiry. And from that space, let's say I have written the story now. And I have created the events wherein I will experience impatience. Now I'll pick up people. I'll say, hey, I will need a mother who can be very impatient with me. You know, because if you, in the childhood, I'll be learning about impatience. You know, I'll be dealt impatiently. I will grow impatient. And then eventually, maybe I'll get stuck with something because of my impatience. Like a health issue or stress or relationship challenge. So that I can get triggered into this inner world. I can get a different turn. And from that turn, the, the journey will open up into the zone of awakening. So the plan, the soul plan, has the events planned. They are pre-planned, but they are not predestined. So there's a difference between both. Okay. For example, mm -hmm. in the life, I have chosen I will meet an accident wherein I have to give up on my leg, let's say. Right? And I go through that. It is pre-planned. But what happens post that? How do I see this? Do I see it as a victimization of myself? Do I complain? Do I blame? Or do I still say myself, it's all right. I think I am, I've been fortunate. I still have the whole body. I can still do something else. It should not stop me. The plan speaks about both these possibilities. So there is no there is no predestined thing like, oh, I will end up here. I will end up being in complaint. No, that is one possibility. The other possibility is maybe I can rise in my own higher potential. I can grow up into that. So everything is pre-planned, but it's not predestined because predestined is the outcome. And outcome is decided once you end up in that story and how you take it forward and how you look at yourself, how you look at the situation, the people around and how you Okay. Wow. That's, that is a wonderful example. 
beautiful thank you so much uh, hitesh um well i can see you have written a beautiful book uh, sundaram speaks um, conversations to awaken your soul's wisdom and it's highly acclaimed one can you share what inspired you to write this book and what are the central message that you want the readers to take from this book so uh, this book came into the existence it took birth in 2019 so in one of the programs during 2018 in uh, quantum life university with dr newton and dr lakshmi uh, you know this program is called life between lives so here we explore you know between two lives where are you what are you doing we explore those realms how do you write your script and you know just now we were speaking about the soul contract soul plan soul tribe and family so this is where you are putting things in line before you take the birth before you take the body so during that uh, you know that experience i just came across my own higher self and it just presented itself as sundaram and uh, you know i from there i started to communicate with it regularly and and i think one fine day it just told me that it is now time for us to give it a shape of a book and you know and that's how it came you know until then i felt oh writing a book is not a cup of you know my cup of tea i cannot do it but then it came and i just paid heed to it and that's how the book came into existence the very message of sundaram well sundaram is nothing which is very personal to me if i say oh it is my higher self sundaram is the very soul you know speaking to your soul means speaking to sundaram each one of us carry sundaram it's nothing it's not mine it's everybody's like atman is everybody's so sundaram sundaram belongs to everyone and the very message it offers is that there is beauty in everything like you know we are able to see beauty in the lotus but we are not able to see beauty in the mud but if there is no mud there is no lotus so same way there is beauty in everything if there is beauty in health there is beauty in illness uh, your illness can absolutely make you humble it can make you so graceful that your health can also not make you it carries such a great power and that's where you know uh, like it has come into the picture and it speaks about light and dark you know because when we grow into the world of uh, you know the spirituality we are more into positive and light and we reject the dark and the more we reject the dark the more dark chases us the more we go deep down in that pit so it speaks that you know dark is not bad you know and it speaks about have heart for dark it says that for a for a seed to sprout it first had to enter the dark it goes deep inside the earth and there it gets sprouted and from there on it becomes a sapling and further you know like a tree in the same manner for us to grow we have to first experience the dark and from the dark when we ask these questions when we you know raise an inner inquiry we offer ourselves the platform to sprout and you know cultivate ourselves so the darkness leads us to you know the creation the mother's womb is nothing but dark and but the the very potential of that dark is creating the world creating the life such is the potential of dark when we close our eyes when we meditate it is nothing the deepest of meditation is nothing but dark so dark has its own beauty so much so if you are asked to sleep under the light you will not have a sound sleep you will say oh please pull off the curtains and let me just sleep switch off the light so such is the beauty of dark it speaks about have heart for dark for you to be stationed in light and that's where you know the whole book expands and it speaks about accepting what you don't like accepting what you don't own accepting your own shadows because by accepting that you become whole and complete and uh, you know it takes up 
uh, so many examples from, so the book is divided into two sections. One is the physical plane and the other one is the spiritual plane. In the physical plane, it speaks about the physicality, how you should look at the world. You know, because like the example I gave to you from the lotus and the mud, you know, we like the lotus, we don't like the mud, but mud has its own beauty. You know, if you can't appreciate the beauty of mud, you cannot appreciate the beauty of the lotus. In the same way, like from the negativity, from what we call as dark, it, it makes a possibility for the light to show up. So they both go hand in hand. Like Shiva is light. Shakti is dark. The Kali is always shown in dark. She is like that, uh, you know, that, that sky which we experience in the pitch dark night, the Amavasya night. She's that. But they walk hand in hand. They're never alone. They're never completely Shiva, completely Shakti. Only when we embrace both these experiences of life, we become balanced. Because everything here in life has come out of balance, not out of balance. Like, I might have a male body, but there is a female port inside me. Somebody might have a female body, but they also have a male port inside of them. So our job is to meet that port. If I am in a male body, my job is to meet that female port. Because by meeting that female port, I will become Ardhanarishwara. And in the same way, for a female to meet that male port, she will become Ardhanarishwara. So everything has come from the amalgamation of Ardhanarishwara. They are basically creating the whole world. We see this Lord Shiva in Ardhanarishwara. He is actually, you know, the real form of God. He is he's an androgynous being. He is neither male nor female. And in the same manner, the world is neither male nor female. It is androgynous in nature and comes from the space of balance. So it speaks about that. And uh, in the second part, it speaks about how do we, you know, set up ourselves from the space of death, what happens during death and how do we move ahead with death and, you know, and how do we plan and, you know, the Bardo planes. It speaks about all of that, the script and the tribe and then how do we take birth. It speaks about that. Wow. I made a note of that. The word, the phrase of the day, have heart to the dark. Okay. Thank you so much. So beautifully laid out. And I'm now very curious to read the book. Definitely I'll pick one. <laughs> well, it's close to time. I wish really, you know, have this uh, more of interaction with you. Uh, before I pass it on to the audience questions or anyone, I have one last question, uh, rather very simple question. Could you share any kind of daily practices or rituals that you personally find uh, very essential for maintaining uh, a connection to your inner wisdom and uh, overall well-being? So when I wake up in the morning, uh, the very first thing I do is I wake up and I put my feet on the ground. Before I put, I you know, bow down to the Mother Earth. And then I sit up and I say that today I will give my best to whatever life offers. So I will give my best. There might happen certain things which are uncomfortable to me, which I don't like. But just by saying this, I offer myself a gift of presence, you know, that I'm going to be present to that. Life is not going to be a fairy land. It is going to give me something which is unfairy. So I'm going to offer my best to it. That's what I say. And then, you know, my day starts with meditation. Right after that, I meditate. And, and usually sometimes I wake up at 4 and 3. And whensoever I get the time, like 3, 4. Between 3, 4, I usually get up. And I meditate for some time, like 1, 1 and a half hours. And then I also do some bit of yoga nidra. Like I will lie down and you know, just witness what is happening inside of me. And because that is the time when certain mystical experiences, certain guidance also emerges. So I utilize that. And then, you know, we go for a walk. Shubhangi and I, we go for a walk. And just normal routine. We work and you know, go into our day-to-day -day routine, like working with people, speaking to people. And 
sometimes we are traveling and then we go there we spend time with our family i think that's how the whole day goes and you know shubhangi and i we like watching movies also so when we are not doing anything we definitely go and watch movies and in the night we definitely read something something that uh, you know that connects to our heart and we read that and then some bit of meditation and then we close up wow thank you so much well rashmi over to you i do not want to waste a single second for the audiences also to pour in their questions or if you have any questions uh, how do you rashmi thank you sunil and thank you so much it is sir it is just profound sharing and listening i mean i could have sat here for another one hour listening to you yes uh, it is <laughs> and the questions were so connected like you could feel that it is our question that sunil is asking so i have not much of a question and uh, i'm open to friends asking like this is the best time to interact with hitesh sir uh, meanwhile if you can shed some light how did you come up with that uh, name for your organization life here and now i was very <laughs> curious when you switched off the camera i saw that uh, that wordings and that um, that sign infinity sign so i was very curious to know i think it just came in the inner vision because most of the times we run for greener pastures we run from where we are you know we are either in the past or in the future so life here and now is a reminder that the potential lies in now you don't have to run you just have to be and the potential is infinite in nature so that's where yeah i think that is so connected to the theme which we have for these sessions also this is like be infinite with your oneness is what we are we are trying to uh, give it to the audience so that is beautiful uh, friends you can post your questions in chat or you can uh, raise your hands we are, we can take up the questions uh, meanwhile uh, we have couple of projects like pyramid projects running in us just like how we have the uh, pyramids in india so we have uh, sharma sir from dallas um they have a omega pyramid coming up in dallas so i would like to invite sharma sir to speak few words hi sharma sir uh, hi rashmi thank you hitesh uh, ji namaskar i i uh, uh, watched your sessions some of your sessions on youtube and i read your book sundaram speaks a uh, couple of years back Am- amazing book and today's session is also very 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 amazing very very insightful thank you so much so so i live in dallas so our team so we are uh, we are building uh, a mega pyramid called omega pyramid in dallas area uh, it is going to be like kartal pyramid so i wanted to uh, so this pyramid name we have named is uh, as omega pyramid i wanted to uh, get your insights uh, about the pyramids so if you might have uh, got because you have been here i mean in this uh, spirituality from two two decades so what are what are your experiences with pyramids and all yeah so i will share so uh, this is not the first time that i am listening that omega pyramid is coming uh, because this was shared to me by uh, i think i hope you all must be knowing alekha shastri so yes. once i was having yes. lunch with them and she talked about that you know an omega pyramid is going to show up and i absolutely felt it so beautiful and i gave her the example of amazon uh, during that time i'll tell you about that because if you see the the logo of amazon amazon at one point in time we will say amazon jungles like you know the way the jungles are vast the amazon name is also coming up like that but at the same time if you see uh, underneath amazon there is a narrow that moves from a to z so it is twofold it is mentioned in a beautiful way a to z that means you can get everything a to z and the same manner i see omega pyramid you know omega is the beautiful vibration the mind vibration that we have at the same time beautifully kept name i think omega and that too also mega so 
I think beautifully put and it really gives a lot of uh, amazing vibration. Yeah, just... so we were so so yeah. Just before the Anamaha Chakram in Dallas uh, last uh, last year, so we were Sampath Sampath sir from Australia. I think uh, pro probably you know him, and uh, Chandu Chandu sir from Pyramid Valley Manager. So yes. so and our team. So we were all meditating, and uh, so we were uh, uh, trying to name the pyramid, and so this name. So uh, it should be a mega. And uh, maybe some ohm. So we were thinking of a different like this. So and the, it 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 occurred like omega his name. So then again we meditated and got the confirmation that the yeah, name should be omega. So immediately so Chandu sir so he messaged uh, Shalini madam. Uh, so she immediately pulled the message uh, Patriji's message about uh, omega. So Omega, uh, he, Patriji said, Omega is the highest state of consciousness. So uh, we go from Alpha to Omega. So, yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. So, <laughs> that's, that is why I say it is big thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. So we need your energies for this project. Yes. And also, uh, so... We are, uh, so we are getting this Shambhala pyramid in uh, North Carolina. Uh, so Rishmi, <laughs> uh, yeah. we'll talk to that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank I mean, you so much. That Patriji. was Patriji's vision. Uh, he visited Raleigh in 2018, and uh, he suggested building 108 pyramids in that spot. It, it is a farmland now. So yeah, the team here is trying. The best we have been doing, Sangalpa Dhyana, and uh, we are hosting DMC, uh, Dhyana Mahachakra, this year in Rally. So uh, we might yeah. get the pyramid uh, soon. Yes, it is bound yeah. to. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any questions, and I don't see anybody who has raised their hands. So I think we can call it a day. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for your wisdom your uh, your experiences your journey it was amazing listening to it and thank you sunil for picking the right questions to get the right information out of him thank you so much oh, and uh, i'm glad to... thank you so much uh, hitesh it was all because of your uh, work which inspired thank you you led it so beautifully i think the questions were just beautiful thank you thank you for having thank you me. thank you sharma ji for connecting yeah. in whatsapp I think thank you for having and thank you yeah, th thank you thank yeah, you, thank yeah, you so we much. have pmc who's uh like uh live telecasting this in youtube so thank you to pmc channel PMC. and thank you all the partners like this is not possible without uh selfless help from a lot of organizations so ifss and shambhala from india omega pyramid and meditation magic from dallas and we have beam uh, from Germany and Breath Universe from Australia. It is like a combined effort of a lot of volunteers to build this platform, Infinity. So thank you all for joining and thank you once again, Hitesh, sir, and see you all next week, same time. Thank you.